intuitive missions. And I just wanna welcome all of you students and families who are attending today's panel. This panel is for career services. And um, before I make introductions and I toss it over to uh, Jonathan Rosenfeld, I do want to instruct you on how you can submit your questions. This is primarily an opportunity for you to post questions to our illustrious career services staff. And um, you can do so by hovering over the bottom bar of your screen to Q&A. And if you just click on the Q&A option and type in your answer, I, of course, will fill those questions to our panelists. And in some cases, we actually have some wonderful admission staff who can address um, some of the questions as well. So we hope that during this um, panel discussion, we'll have an opportunity to address all of your questions. So without further ado, I am going to toss it over to Jonathan Rosenfeld. Um, I'm going to give you the job of doing all the introductions because you oversee the Career Services Office. So Jonathan. Hi, I actually will take it. Okay, uh, okay. Um, I mean, not too. <laughs> No <laughs> Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we hope that you are doing well, and we are so excited to be engaging with you this afternoon. My name is Aminatu Urbongo. Feel free to call me Aminatu and Ami. And I oversee business career services here at Loyola, and we support undergraduate students, graduate students, as well as Quinlan School of Business alumni. Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sounds good. Thanks, Ami. So my name is Andrea Beaumont. I work with the pre-health advising team here at Loyola University Chicago. Um, we work with anyone from the all of you, the moment you are admitted to Loyola on through alumni. Um, we have, have a lot of resources that we absolutely enjoy. And I'm going to try to turn it over to John, but he had warned us that he'd been having a little internet connectivity issues, so we will cross our fingers. John, you up? Yes. Thank you. Um, apologies in advance. All of a sudden today, things seem to be very weird. So um, I'm John Rosenfield. I'm Associate Director for Career uh, Development Advising and Education. So my team works uh, direct one-on-one -on -one advising with all of those students who do not attend the Quinlan School of Business. Uh, and so there's a wide range of services and support that we offer students throughout their, their time and, and even after their time at Loyola. Uh, and uh, I'll talk to you in a little bit. Perfect. And what I can share with you is we do have some colleagues that weren't able to join us here and they work closely with our recruitment effort as well as our marketing and communication. We also have colleagues who are from the fellowship office. Our goal today is we really want to make sure to spend more time on questions and answers because we recognize that y'all will likely have a lot of questions for all of us and specifically maybe some for some of us based on our areas and the work that we do. And so what you will notice is I'll go through the presentation pretty quickly, make sure that you have a good sense of the resources and services that we are able to provide, but really focus on the Q&A component. With that being said, thank you so much, Angie, for showing the presentation. So it appears we might be having some tech issues and this is okay. And honestly, this is a great example of what may be happening if you are interviewing for a position. You might be ready, you might have your materials ready to go, and then all of a sudden you have some IT issues. So we appreciate your flexibility as we are um, fixing these IT issues and we will be with you very, very shortly. I'm sharing it now. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angie. No worries. All right. As I shared, we will make sure to go through these slides pretty quickly so we can focus on Q 
Q&A. So we are career services here at Loyola. One thing that's very unique about career services is that we have a centralized career services. And so all of us work together to make sure that all of you are supported. Within career services, you'll notice opportunities including student engagement, um, as well as specialty advising, and we make sure to connect you with employers, alumni, as well as community members, not only in Chicago, but internationally and globally. So within career services, here are all the areas that we have, and we just went around and introduced ourselves. And one thing that I do want to note is you'll notice that employer relations and employer operation is also included. And our colleague, Jim Conan was able to join us. So Jim, if you wanna say a quick hello, that would be great. Sure, thanks, Tommy. Uh, I'm Jim Conan. I'm the Senior Associate Director of Employer Relations and Recruiting. And I lead um, our efforts across campus to connect with employers to help open up job and internship opportunities for students. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jim. And so we'll move to the next slide. All right. So regarding student employment and federal work study, one thing that we want to make sure that we prioritize is making sure that we're supporting our students who have federal work study and making sure that they not only have opportunities, but opportunities that are meaningful, opportunities where they're able to grow their skill sets, and then also opportunities where they are able to contribute. And so what's really great is that you're going to notice there are a lot of opportunities when you officially start at Loyola. Those opportunities are gonna be posted on Handshake, which is our job portal website that we will talk uh, more about in a few minutes. And what's great about our student employment and federal work study opportunities is that many of them do take place on campus, but there are also a lot of off-site opportunities. So that allows you to naturally expand your network as well as connect with different employers throughout Chicago and the U.S. You will have the opportunity to access Handshake, which is our job portal around mid-July. So please be on the lookout for that so that you can make sure that you're ready to go. One thing that I do want to note about all opportunities at Loyola and Handshake is that you have to have your resume pre-approved in order to be able to apply for opportunities. And the reason that we do this is we want to make sure that you are putting your best foot forward and best representing yourself. And so please start working on those resumes and make sure that once you have access, you're uploading. And if you are sitting there completely overwhelmed because you don't even know how to begin creating a great resume, do not worry because all of our team is here and ready to support you through that process. And the student employment and federal work study wages, one thing that I do wanna note is that it's just like any other opportunities where you do get a wage and you will get paid every other week. Thank you, we'll move to the next slide. So now I'm going to talk about something that I'm especially passionate about, which is the business career services. As I shared, I lead and oversee our team. Our main focus is connecting passion to purpose. And so we really want to make sure from the moment that you step on campus that you are well equipped in order to meet this expectation. So that means supporting you through that discernment process as you're trying to understand what may be the best option or options for you, supporting you through your career readiness, preparation and management, and then making sure that you are in a great position as you're applying for jobs not only through during your time at Loyola but also beyond. You'll one thing that is very unique about Quinlan School of Business is that every single undergraduate student has to take BSAT 220, which is our career readiness course. And through that course, you're going to learn critical skill sets, including how to create your resume, how to build your LinkedIn profile, how to successfully network and gain mentorship opportunities, and example. We also have a program called the Q Mentorship Program that is available to our students. And what's really great about the Q Mentorship Program is it connects you with Loyola and Quinlan alums, as well as friends of Loyola. 
Business Career Services also works closely with colleagues to make sure that you have strong fall and spring on campus recruiting programs, opportunities to engage with employers, and we make sure that we support you through that process, including how to prepare for that interview, how to negotiate once you have the offer, how to make sure that you're always putting your best foot forward. And we'll move next. And then, as John said, he, him and his team really supports all of the students from all of the other schools. So they also do an excellent job in making sure that you are prepared and supported. You will receive individualized career development advising. And one thing that's really incredible about what their team does is that they specialize in that developmental piece of advising. So they really help you to understand who are you? What are your strengths? What are your options? And what is the plan that you need to make in order to get there? And not only are you avail able to gain some perspective through their one-on-one -on -one advising sessions, but you also have opportunities to engage with their career advisors through the career self-assessment workshops and through their career development courses that is available for first year all the way to four year students. And so they offer two sections, the UNIV 102 and UNIV 224. So UNIV 102 is going to be the course that's really about exploring and planning and trying to identify what is. Um, and then UNIV 224 is more of that action step and how are we going to do what is. Um, and both of those courses are available um, every single year and are great options for you to take. And our colleagues in this office also make sure that they support you with the job strategies, um, the job search strategies. They want to make sure that all of your materials are strong, including your resumes, your cover letters, and they too support you in making sure that you know how to network, how to find mentors, and how to put yourself out there. And then, my, as Andrea shared, she works closely with pre-health advising. We know that this is a very exciting and very important resource for many of our students, especially many of our incoming students. And so you can be assured that you will be well served when you're on campus by the Office of Free Health Advising. They offer support to you not only in one-on-one -on -one sessions, but also in group capacities. For example, you'll notice that they too offer courses, including UNIV 102, which is exploring the pre-health profession. What I can share with you is I used to serve as an academic advisor at Loyola. And when I was an academic advisor, this course was one that filled very quickly because students appreciate the high level of exposure and support that they were able to experience. We recognize that there are high in demand. And so our career our, our pre-health team makes sure that they're also available through, by providing workshops, by active, actively s sending correspondences that you will receive when you arrive to campus and also throughout your time at Loyola. There are a couple programs that I want to make sure that I highlight. The first one is the Early Acceptance Program with the Strict School of Medicine, the Dual Acceptance Program with Midwestern University, Chicago College a pharmacy and the pre-health award. And Andrea, I'm gonna put you on the spot real quick. Do you mind quickly sharing about those opportunities? Just because I know that oftentimes folks have a lot of questions about this. Yep, I can definitely take that back over from you, Ami. So the early acceptance program is a partnership that we have with the Stritch School of Medicine where students would apply the summer after your sophomore year, so after the second year at Loyola's Lakeshore campus, it's an online application that there's, we treat it the same as any other medical school interview. If you make it through all the rounds, then by the time you're, you're a couple months into your junior year, you could already have a conditional acceptance to the Stritch School of Medicine. So that's, there's obviously a lot of steps to that, but that is one program that we offer. The dual acceptance program is similar in that it's a partnership with a, another university, it's Mid Midwestern University's College of Pharmacy. So for those of you, there's two different tracks to that. Um, there's track one and track two. So if you're accepted already as part of track one, fabulous. If you're just now learning about it and you want to join this program, track two is an option for you. Um, but either way, you'll take two years of coursework at Loyola and then assuming you do everything right, you'll immediately start over at the College of Pharmacy at Midwestern. And the Pre-Health Award is one of our favorites. As long as you 
are a fabulous pre-health student and you read the emails and you apply for the application, you have an opportunity to get an award. We cannot call it anything using the financial word because of tax purposes, but there is a monetary incentive to that award. So we have a lot of great programs and, and means that we use to support our students because we know that the application process, assuming you don't go through EAP, is, is an expensive one to get, apply to medical and dental school. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrea. And I'm sure that we will have many questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So next, we will make sure that we discuss, if you don't mind clicking on the next slide, our pre-law advising. So one thing that is interesting about pre-law is that oftentimes incoming students may say I'm majoring in pre-law. And the thing is that pre-law is, is not a major, but it's a track that you follow. So what's great about pre-law is that you can major in anything and still be towards that pre-law tracks. So students tend to really appreciate this flexibility and option. What I can share is that our pre-law advising colleagues are here and ready and excited to support you. They assist you in your discernment process, trying to understand, is law school something for me, not only personally, professionally, um, but also is this something that I want to commit to? And if so, how can I set myself up so that I'm competitive in that application process and end up being in a law school and in a law program that allows me to bring my best self and best contribute to the world? And so pre-law advising makes sure it's to give you the individual support. They have programming throughout the academic year that's available to you on campus. And obviously, because of the situation that we are going through, we continue to offer virtual and remote opportunities, not only from a pre-law perspective, but a, from a whole university perspective. One thing that I would share is if you are interested in the law track, make sure that you're reading and paying special attention to the newsletters because you'll notice a lot of helpful information, helpful programming, helpful events, and helpful opportunities to engage with folks that are currently in the law industry. And so next we are going to talk about our fellowship advising team. What I can share with you about the fellowship advising team is that you will get one-on-one -on -one focus and attention if this is something that you're interested in pursuing. And I really cannot stress this enough to folks, is it is critical that you make sure adding the fellowship office to your to-do list once you enter campus. Because I think it's fair to assume that many, if not most, if not all of us, are always seeking opportunities to learn and also seeking opportunities to have financial resources. And what is great about these scholarships is that you will notice that they are available across majors, across discipline, and there's a lot of opportunities for you to grow through that. So we've listed some of the scholarships that are available. And what is exciting is that Loyola students continue to earn these scholarships so that shows the value of who our students are and then also the support that they receive in, in order to be able to get opportunities. Next, we are going to focus on employer relations. And Jim, since you're here, did you wanna quickly share something about employer relations? And Jim, I believe you are muted. There we go. Um, I mentioned earlier that we connect uh, with employers to help uh, create job and internship opportunities for students. We do that for uh, students and majors across the campus uh, and work to make sure that not only are we making those connections for students, but communicating to faculty and staff across campus so students know about those opportunities. In the past, we've had um, uh, what we call our job shadow days, which are visits to key employers. You see on this slide and on the next slide, some of the employers we visited. Um, but the job of employer relations is to interface with those employers, great employers, and make sure that students are aware of those opportunities. Uh, and we're trying to open doors and broker relationships for students as they look for next steps after Loyola. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I can share regarding employer relations is that our Loyola alums 
are also employers and they're also alum. So what's really great is that we are part of this bigger Loyola community and we see that many of our employers are very intentional about wanting to hire fellow Ramblers. And so that is something that I especially appreciate about the work that we do and the folks that we connect with. All right. Um, Within employer relations, we also have employer operations. And so it's really important to us that you have opportunities to directly engage with employers, whether that might be through a career fair, um, and those take place in person as well as virtually. One thing that's very unique about Loyola is that you have the opportunity to attend a tailored um, career fair for every single school. And I know that many of our students appreciate this because they see this as a very intentional and thought time and also a more efficient time because they're able to engage with the employers and the industries that they're interested in. We recognize that um, engaging with employers is not just going to a fair, but sometimes it's great to see what it may be, in, to see what it may be, what a day at Google, for example, may look like. And so we offer every single year the job shadow program. And some of our previous site visits have included Google, the Chicago Blackhawks, American Red Cross, Edelman, Field Museum, Facebook, NU Medicine, and the list goes on. And what's great about job shadow program and site visits, especially with site visits, you will notice that many of our faculty also have connections with employers and past alumni. So they may offer site visits through their courses um, or through programming that they offer within the department, which is a great way and opportunity for you to engage with employers. We also wanna make sure to plug LU Connect Mentoring. So this is a mentoring opportunity that's available to students and it's an alumni to student flash mentoring. Um, and then for students who are part of the Quinlan School of Business, there is going to be a new mentoring platform that is going to be announced in the fall semester. So I encourage you to be on the lookout for that announcement and to make sure to join and get connected with mentors as soon as you get to campus. And that is all that we have for our presentation today. And so we wanna make sure that we dedicate the rest of this time to answer any questions that you may have for us. One of the first questions, um, well, thank you, Aminatu, first of all, for yeah, the presentation and you know, all the other panelists who, um, of course, jumped in to provide additional information. Uh, one of the first questions that came in that's pretty popular is, what is the job placement rate upon graduation? And also, to kind of piggyback off of that, what is the medical school placement rate um, after graduation? Excellent. I will let Jim, who oversees employer relations, take that first. I can't speak to the um, to the uh, the pre health placement rate. Um, the last numbers I saw for uh, uh, the university was ninety eight percent of students within six months of graduation had either found opportunities in uh, continuing education or had secured a, a job opportunity. And this is Andrea, I can jump in on the pre-health side of things because that's definitely a question we get versions of often. Um, we have a committee process, which is a one-on-one -on -one process that students will be getting one-on-one -on -one advising the spring semester prior to submitting their medical school or dental school application, working directly with our faculty and staff on campus. So we track for the students that go through that committee process, what their acceptance rate is. And again, this is for medical and dental school. Um, the numbers that we usually go with are a greater than 70% acceptance rate. We've actually just within the last week been re-looking at numbers from the last five years and we have to do a little bit of double checking, crossing all of our, our dots, T's, dotting our I's type thing. But we're actually in the last five years looking at a greater than 75% acceptance rate for medical and dental school. So it's definitely a mixture of we have fabulous faculty who do a great job teaching our students but also the students that go through this committee process get a lot of one-on-one -on -one guidance with, with the advisors on the committee to be sure that their personal statements are ready, their letters of rec are ready, everything is ready. I have a question here that I think a lot of freshmen will have. What kind of opportunities are available 
available to incoming freshmen who have limited work experience? Yeah, what I can share is that as I mentioned, every single student has to get onto Handshake, which is Loyola's job portal. And so if you are in a position where you do not have a lot of work experience, please do not be very stressed about this or do not feel that that is going to put you behind. That is one of the resources that you should absolutely take advantage of, which is connecting to your career advisor or your career coach. And we can definitely help you in building that resume and then also asking what type of experience that you want to gain during your time at Loyola. And one thing that's really nice about opportunities within Handshake is you'll notice that many of them will have a wide range of what they're looking for. And there are many companies out there that are eager to have folks who may not have extensive experience because they recognize that you are in college and this is a developmental process. So if you're in a position where you have limited, do not fret. And what you might be pleasantly surprised by is that many of our students share that once they do connect with a career advisor or career coach, and once they start having conversations, they realize that they may not have a specific name or title, but they have skill sets that they have gained from being in class or engaging with people, whether it's their family members or members of their community that translate into what employers and companies are looking for. Thank you. There's also a question here or several questions about research opportunities. How many of those are paid and do you provide assistance with finding paid research opportunities? I can answer this too. So with research opportunities, there are two areas in the university that I would highly encourage you to seek if this is something that you're interested in. Actually, I will change my answer and say three. Um, the first area is definitely the fellowship office that our colleague Lisa is overseeing. And there's a lot of support that is available there. And she often announces the different scholarship and research opportunities, their deadlines, their criteria, and then make sure to support you through that application process. So you should absolutely check out Lisa's fellowship office. The second department that you should absolutely get to know is the Center for Experiential Learning. And that team has a dedicated area and a dedicated person to research. And so that this is, research is engaged learning and we recognize that it can be a very transformative experience for many of our students. And we prioritize it so much that we make sure that we have a whole team and a specific person whose job it is to find those opportunities for our students and to support them in getting those opportunities. And then the third piece of advice that I would recommend is once you have a sense of what you may want to major in, make sure that you get to know your faculty very well and make sure that you get to know the department chairs very well because oftentimes they will have research and fellowship opportunities that they have and we are all in the business of career services and one thing that I can share with you is that we recognize how important relationships are. So it's really, really critical that once you officially start your time at Loyola, that you start building those relationships and get connected to those faculty, get connected to your career advisor, career coach, get connected to the Center for Experiential Learning, get connected to the fellowship office. Thank you. Now, Andrea, I'm going to bounce to you because we have several questions about pre-health advising. Now, this is a three-part question. I'm combining three so we can make the most right. of this time. <laughs> so the first question is, when do incoming freshman students find out who their health advisor is? The second question is, what percent of pre-med students end up with a committee letter? And the last question is, how competitive is the EAP program? All right, so well, I'll be happy to repeat those if you need me to. Yes. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I was gonna say, I'm gonna start with the first and I'll probably need a reminder. Absolutely. Um, so the, the pre-health advising office, we're actually, unlike so, like first and second year advising where you're assigned a specific academic advisor, our office takes an all hands on deck, first come first served approach to advising. So you're not assigned a specific pre-health advisor. Um, you literally through Handshake, through that online resource that we'd mentioned earlier, you can go in there and you can just look 
at all of our calendars and whoever has the first available appointment, that's who you are absolutely welcome to schedule with. Um, certainly some students do realize, you know, I've, I've met with Andrea once every semester for two years. I've, I've got a rapport going with her. I want to continue meeting with her. That is certainly welcome also, but it's we, we don't assign a specific pre-health advisor because we want to be sure that we're as available as possible as quickly as possible because we do tend to be in, in a bit of a demand. Um, the, the second, second question is percentage of pre-med students that end up with the committee letter. Right, so I, can, I, I can't answer that specifically, and I'm gonna explain why in just a moment, because we, within Loyola, in terms of the committee process, we, that process is open, like I said we work, earlier, we work with alumni, so we, you'll go through that committee process at a specific time right before you're planning to apply to medical school. So it may be if you want to go straight from Loyola, immediately start medical school, you would apply for the committee process your junior year. Maybe if you want to take a gap year, you want to apply for the committee process your senior year. So we track the how many of folks are going through the committee process. Um, on a typical year, we have approximately at least 300 of the numbers been creeping up in the last couple of years, a lot closer to 350 folks that apply and start that committee process at the beginning of any given spring semester. And then for a variety of reasons throughout the spring semester, students may realize I'm, I'm not quite ready to apply this particular year, maybe MCAT studying wasn't going quite as well as they wanted. Um, so typically by the end of the summer, we're writing about 200 committee letters. Um, and it, that is that is a pretty typical melt that we have in that process. And that, like I said, that is pretty much always completely students choosing, um, this isn't the year for me, next year though, next year is my year. And we definitely have some students that come back and repeat that committee process. And of course, the final question is, how competitive is the EAP program? And that's, that's another one that it really, it, it varies year to year. Um, we've had the fortunate blessing these last couple of years that it has been a fairly competitive process. And we are, as you may know from our pre-health webpage, the, there's a couple steps to the process. The Lakeshore Selection Committee is allowed to advance up to 10 names, 10 applications to the Stritch School of Medicine to review and potentially interview out at Stritch. Um, and every time when we meet to, to pick who those 10 names are, we really find ourselves thinking, gosh, there's at least 12 to 15 folks here who we think are fabulous and we're really struggling to, to narrow that list down to those 10 names. So we're, we're fortunate that, that we have such a competitive pool, but we do definitely like to be honest and upfront with folks that it is by no means a guaranteed situation. And if somebody is interested in EAP, we really encourage you, come meet with us from maybe not day one, but month one, you're, you're beginning a time here on campus because there's a lot of guidance we can give you around. It's partly about classes and being sure you have the right classes and strong grades, but it's also about all of the outside the classroom experiences and being sure that you really tailor those to what's unique for you, not just what do you think Stritch is looking for. Thank you so much, Andrea. I do want to pose a question to the entire panel. Can you elaborate on some of the different types of job fairs that are available on campus and how early would you recommend students start attending them? And anyone's free to answer. <laughs> I'm mostly afraid to just because of the tech problems. Wait, is Ami going? I was, but go ahead, John. Yeah, we hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is, uh, you know, it, there's been some flux, and I think that this is, uh, uh, this is throughout uh, higher education. There's been, um, you know, uh, employers and students are sort of finding new and different ways that they want to engage with employers. Um, so we've really gone to a more tailored model. Um, we used to have two big all university fairs that's just down to one all university fair that's in the fall which really uh is is uh geared towards uh internship uh student employment and uh, uh part-time work that type of thing uh, but then we have tailored fairs uh throughout the year that are um you know several that are uh, corresponding to the Quinlan school of business specifically the school of communication um stem um so really more tailored throughout the year uh, and, and there's, I would say that probably for each major set of programs or school, there's, there's at least one that takes place each year. But then I'm going to let Ami and, and perhaps Jim uh, uh, talk about that. Yeah, and to answer the question about 
when should you attend and how early? What I can, I can speak specifically about within the Quinlan School of Business. So for example, our fairs, which take place every single semester, so we have one in the fall, as well as one in the spring for all business opportunities. And as John mentioned, we do have specialized fairs. So for example, we have a specific fair for our marketing students or a specific fair for our supply chain students. But the fair that is for all business opportunities is called the Quinlan Career and Networking Fair. And one piece that I want to make sure to emphasize is that networking piece. So often folks forget that when you attend a fair, it's not, I'm going to this fair, I'm talking to this employer, I'm getting this job. Oftentimes you have to network and build and cultivate those relationships. That leads to a job or that leads to an outcomes. And so to answer the question, regardless if you're in the business school or in the College of Arts and Sciences or the Institute for Environmental Science, um, sciences, for example, you need to start going to fairs as early as your first year. You need to learn how to be comfortable in those environments. You need to learn um, how you would like to present and brand yourself. And what gets better is that networking and mentoring, this is a skill set that we are all having to work on all of our lives. And the best way to start is to start. And so I encourage you to start right away. And something that you'll appreciate about our fairs is that we will make sure that we never put you in a position where you are just walking blindly into a fair. So we often provide resources prior to fairs so that you feel comfortable, so that you know how to navigate those. So definitely take advantage of all of those resources. Jim, did you wanna talk specifically about the second half of the question? Uh, actually, I didn't hear either half of the question. I think I know uh, uh, what was the second half. So I'm I'm uh, answering the right question. I I asked uh, what types of fairs are available and how early do you see or rather recommend that students start attending the career fairs. You know, I I think it makes sense for students to go as early as possible. A first year student wouldn't be saying I'm trying to lock down that full time job for after I graduate. But career fairs are a great, a great way to talk to recruiters, find out what companies you're looking for, find out what kinds of opportunities are available. Uh, and the nice thing about going when you're a first year student is you have nothing to lose. You can practice talking to recruiters. Um, if it goes terribly, worst case scenario, a recruiter won't remember, or if they do and you're better next year, they'll say, I remember you. Uh, last year, not so good, but you've grown so much. Let's talk some more. It's a great and way to find out more about what's available uh, to practice those skills. Uh, and it's, um, it's time well spent. For some classes, you can get extra credit if you go to career fairs, depending on what course of study you're in. But uh, sooner is better. And what and all, you, oh, I'm sorry. Um, although I don't directly advise students, um, the sooner students go to see career advisors and career coaches, the better. Uh, it doesn't cost anything extra. It's great advice from skilled people who really care about th what they're doing and want to help students. Uh, the sooner you go, the better off you are. Yeah, and one thing that I do want to stress about to answer your question, Angie, the first is that at our fairs, we're not just recruiting for full-time opportunities. Um, and we're not just recruiting specifically for a job per se. So for example, John had mentioned a fair that takes place during the fall semester. A lot of that fair is volunteer and engagement opportunities. So that could be a great place to start as a first year incoming student. And at the fairs, there are part-time, full-time opportunities. There are internship opportunities. And so there's a wide range of opportunities. So definitely don't feel limited um, and the best way to start is, as I share it, is to start. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Okay, so I have two more questions before we want to wrap up. We do have a session starting right after this. A um, couple more questions for you, Andrea. I'm just going to double up again. Um, one, how often do you see pre-health majors that double major? And two, how often do you see uh, students who go into medical school who don't go the traditional route, I'm meaning like they don't major in a hard science. So 
the, the first one in terms of the double major, I don't have an exact percentage, but it's very common. Um, I will definitely warn students if you're looking to major in thing, two things that are very different. So if you want to do an international relations and a biology where there's no hope of those courses overlapping, you need to plan ahead. Um, you need to notify your academic advisor, your first and second year advisor. You can't decide that your junior year. It's just not physically possible. Um, but if you plan ahead, we definitely have a good number of students that do that. Um, it, 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 you got to be dedicated. You got to be on top of the ball because there's a lot to keep track of for both of those majors. But we, we pretty regularly see students. A little bit more common for us to, is to see students that say, I couldn't pick between biology and neuroscience where there's a little bit of overlap and they love both. Um, but we definitely see students double majoring pretty regularly. Um, and remind me of the second question. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so the second question was, how often do you see students who don't go the traditional track go into medical school, meaning they don't uh, major in a hard science? Okay, yeah. So, so that's another one where uh, we, we don't track exactly percentage X major amount of majors get into X medical school. Um, but I will give an example that we had a couple years back, one of our students that got the most acceptances that of that particular year was a history major. He was a fabulous student. He was really strong. He did his science prerequisite courses and he did well in them. So medical schools knew he was a, a strong science student, but his research, everything was history and medical schools in his personal statement in his interview, they loved it because he was able to talk about in my history major, I'm learning skills about how to read between the lines and pick up on details because I can't go ask these folks. They've been dead a long time. Um, and th those were insightful skills that medical schools loved. So we definitely encourage students um, medical schools say they get enough biology majors they don't want cookie cutter applications they want students pursue your passions and be sure that you're able to prove that you can handle the science coursework but also find that connection how does that passion is that going to make you a better doctor one day and that's those are the conversations we love to have with our students thank you andrea and one last question for the entire panel before we close out. And if your question is not answered, let me um, share this with uh, the attendees. If your question is not answered, we will have some contact information that we will put on the screen where um, you can reach out to us. We plan to disseminate some of the questions that went unanswered to our wonderful career services um, staff and um, they'll be able to get back with you. But I did want to close with one last question for the panel. What is the biggest piece of advice that you can offer for incoming students when it comes to career and being proactive um, about um, research opportunities, internships, and long-term career goals or meeting those rather? I, uh, I will I'll go ahead and say this it, it, someone someone used the word earlier process I think that this is very much a process um, the beginning of college is truly the beginning of the process oftentimes the end of college is the end of the beginning of the process look at these next four years as a time to experiment um, to have lots of different experiences to take in a lots of different information discover different passions don't uh, don't back yourself into a corner uh, this summer, you've got lots of time to experience a lot of great things. I'm going to jump in there. Oh, oh go ahead, Andrea. Say, re related to that, we talk often in pre-health that everybody's path to medicine, to medical school, to dental school, to PA, PT, I don't want to ignore the other areas of the health professions. Everybody's path looks different. And part of that process is figuring out what your own path looks like, but don't compare to others. That would be my two bits. Mm -hmm. I think part of my advice would be that um, when people ask you the question, so what are you going to do after you graduate, saying, I am not sure yet is an acceptable answer. Uh, don't feel like you have to know now. Uh, you don't. Uh, I uh, just started, made a transition after a couple career moves into higher ed about five years ago. I did not know when I was in college that I'd be working in higher ed. I didn't know in my 20s or my 30s or my 40s. I didn't know. So you don't have to know. Keep your options open. You don't have to decide now. It's a great time to explore, look at options, think about what you want to do and why and where your skills are. Uh, so like others have said, it's a great time to explore and don't feel pressure from anybody 
who looks like me with white hair who says, so what's happening after graduation? You don't have to know right now. And the advice that I would give to you is that there are so many resources available to you at Loyola. And what is great is our community is great and our community is strong and our community is wide. But all of these resources and all of these people and connections don't matter if you don't take action. So it's really important that you take advantage of all of these resources, that you visit these offices, that you get to know your faculty, that you get to know all the different staff members, and most importantly, that you get to know your peers, because you have to remember regardless of what you do or what you decide, you are going to be working with people in some capacity. And the world is a very small, world and even though it feels big it's very small and you never know someone that you might have in an intro to communication course might be someone that helps you someday in some capacity that you could never have imagined so definitely make sure that you take action and that you make the most out of your college experience because you don't want to be in a position uh, where you are graduating and you get that diploma and then you think, I wish I would have, or I didn't know I could have. Definitely go out, explore, ask questions, have fun, and be Loyola proud. Thank you all so much um, for joining us today. Thank you to all of our panelists from um, our Career Services Office. Um, I know that they addressed a lot of questions, but if you do have any lingering questions, I think there were about two that we didn't get to, then these are some great resources for you to text an admissions counselor, a current student, email our office, um, emailing financial aid, and of course, visiting us on our website. And then of course, uh, we do plan to compile any of these questions um, that remain and send them to our career services office where they of course are the experts and they can provide you with some responses. Thank the panelists again, and thank you attendees for joining us today, and y'all have a great evening. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Great job. <laughs>